Hello and welcome to another instructional session regarding the practices and procedures of applied behavior analysis. The precise, data-directed, scientific approach to changing behavior to a more social acceptability. I'm Tom McIntyre, Director of BehaviorAdvisor.com, and today we look at the gathering of numerical data in order to help us better understand and address behaviors of concern, guide us in our interventions, and assist us in determining if those interventions are indeed effective. In the first segment, we'll look at how we devise a precise definition for the action under scrutiny, and how we determine to which aspect or dimension we should attend. Why do we even bother to eyeball a young person and gather data on his or her actions? The answer? To determine, is that behavior a problem? Is it changing? Or is our intervention working? On the slide, we see that the youth is defiant. Okay, but how is that particular kid defiant? In which way? There are many ways to be defiant. We need to construct an operational definition of the term that identifies, gosh, what would we need to know? We would need to know how to precisely and accurately identify the action so that there's no doubt what it is that we're looking for and what we're assessing. Which aspects of that behavior, we'll call them dimensions from this point on, should be observed. We'll also know how to go about collecting this data and how to make some sense of it. We'll also need to determine the where and the when of our observations. Yes, when we're defining the behavior, we have to be very precise. The definition should be quite exacting. You'll see there in the second point that we want to avoid words that sound as if we're mind reading. Words like intentionally and on purpose. We're looking to define the behavior, not yet the reason behind it. And sometimes we do list the behaviors that are not included in our definition but the focus typically is on what we're looking for. We define the target behavior, not the off-target behavior. Now, right now, I would say that I'm standing. I'm not, but imagine it. While I attempt to stand erect, given the time of day and the burdens of life, some folks might say I'm slouching, like the first image of the gentleman in the red shirt here. So what comprises standing if you were to keep track of it when a pupil was doing so in the back of a classroom? As we might allow for a pupil with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder who's engaged in his work with a clipboard. The fellow with the umbrella, still standing acceptably in your opinion? How about the gents with the white socks? Some say yes, others say no, that they've adopted another stance other than standing. But remember, it does not matter what you call it. Call the behavior snarzel farf if you like. What matters is how you've defined the behavior, the definition, the guide to determining if the action is occurring as you observe the youngster. Define standing so precisely that everyone familiar with the definition knows whether it's occurring or not. Hmm, what, how might we define it? A lot of different ways, but let's all agree on one. In this scenario, we could choose body perpendicular to the floor, no support, two feet on the floor. And if those things are occurring, we say yes. Given that criteria, the youngster is standing. 
Now it's time for you to define a few behaviors. Let's take one of these here down near the bottom on task, a popular desire of teachers for their students to display. Wow, so many tasks and so many ways of being on task. What can we come up with? How about student is engaged in the directed activity? Gee, that covers it all, right? How about another popular request of students? Being in one seat. What's the minimal acceptable criteria for being in seat? How about buttocks in contact with horizontal plane of chair, one foot in contact with the floor? Now, some of my past students had shaping plans to progressively display greater approximation to the final desired behavior. At first, in seat was defined as any part of body in contact with any part of chair. Then, with success, we changed the definition. We required more of the socially acceptable action, buttocks in contact with horizontal plane of chair, having one foot on the floor, nose pointed toward uh, activity or speaker, eyes open, and so forth. Hey, down there at the bottom, non-compliant. Gee, you don't have to account for every possible way of being a refusenik. Just the way that your particular student shows that behavior. For example, fails to follow direction within 10 seconds. This is your chance to pause the podcast and define your behavior in what were those two words we needed to monitor? Oh yes, observable and measurable. We can see it and we can say yes indeed, there it is and record that fact. Let's say that we decide that we wish to modify the use behavior in some manner. There are a number of ways that actions can be changed. Here are some examples of different foci for our data collection. How many times the action happens during a certain time period? The percent of opportunities that it happens. Gee, raising one's hand to answer a question posed by the teacher. What percentage of times when a question was asked did the youngster raise the hand? How long does the behavior last? How big and powerful is it? The form that it takes, as in the acceptability of one's handwriting script where it happens, the locus, the location, and how long it takes between the go and the kid going, like the time between the teacher uttering a direction and the youngster actually engaging in that action. Ah, the dimensions. You may have heard of superficial one-dimensional thinking. Perhaps you've figured the square footage of two-dimensional shapes. We're all familiar with the three dimensions of objects, height, width, depth. Einstein identified a fourth dimension, time. You can go to YouTube and watch the fifth dimension vocal group singing their wonderfully melodic and harmonic, harmonic songs. Scientists say there are 16 dimensions, but we're going to focus on the six that have to do with the measurement of behavior. All right, we have six aspects, traits, characteristics, dimensions of behavior. What are some ways that behaviors can vary from each other? What are some points regarding a behavior that we could notice? Right, a lot of you right away said, well, the frequency, how often the action occurs. You might have also thought of duration. Gee, the behavior can vary or differ in how long it lasts. We might be recording the time, the latency, between the stimulus and a response. 
the time between the do it and the person doing it. A behavior can vary in the force or power with which is exhibited. Perhaps we're concerned about the locus, the location of the behavior, where it was displayed in the environment, or perhaps where on the body. We might be concerned with the topography of the behavior, the form or the shape that it takes, and we'll be addressing each one. At this point, we'll ask you to come up with some actions that are seen in the academic setting that are of concern to educational personnel. Come up with examples for each of the six dimensions. For example, for frequency, you'd think, hmm, what behaviors concern us because they don't happen often enough or they happen too often? Pause the video at this point. When you've come up with some examples, then restart it. All right, let's compare notes. Frequency. Well, some of the often mentioned concerns are call outs, shouting out the answer devoid of having raised one's hand and been recognized. Not getting enough homework submissions. For duration, gee, that youngster's been gone a long time with that bathroom pass. Or perhaps we're monitoring the length of time that one is talking with others. Magnitude? I've heard teachers yell out, it's too loud in here. They're concerned about the magnitude and then use more magnitude to be heard. He hit me. Oh, I only touched him. They're arguing about the magnitude of that physical contact, contact, the force of the hit, velocity times mass. Latency. Yeah, we're concerned about this with direction following. I gave a direction. I'd like it to be followed a little more promptly. Or how about the latency, the time that expires between the bell for the beginning of class and the kids entering through the doorway? Topography. Hmm, the shape of the behavior. We talked earlier about penmanship or perhaps womanmanship. The cultural paper mache masks that we're making in art. Gee, a sub Saharan African mask has a very different style than an East Asian or a Canadian First Peoples mask. We're looking at the shape, the form. As for locus, locus where on the body did it happen or where in the environment? When we say, where does it hurt, dear? Where did all this happen? Out on the playground, or on the bus, or in Mr. Smith's class? Which dimensions have an influence on the accuracy and distance of the javelin throw? Hmm, take a look at that. Accuracy and distance. You know, I used to be the javelin catcher on the team. Uh, my nickname was Pincushion. Here's your quiz. Which dimension applies here? There's a decimeter embedded in a stoplight, and they use it in the cafeteria. And as long as the decibels in the cafeteria are, say, under about uh, 70, 80 decibels dB, it stays on green. But it starts getting louder, then a yellow light comes on to let the kids know it's getting a little bit too loud. And the red light is it's way beyond acceptability. This stoplight is measuring which dimension of behavior. Magnitude. Which dimension here? We're, we're trying to reduce the number of misspellings in a hundred word excerpt that we've taken from a longer composition. Which of the, the dimensions apply? We want to reduce the number. Yes, the frequency, the number of errors, but we're also talking about the topography. The form of the word is incorrect. So either and or <laughs> to, uh, frequency and topography would suffice. 
Ah, uh, the track team sprinters are trying to get out of the blocks quicker when the starting tone sounds. Which dimension are they working on? That's right, latency, the time between the starting tone, the do it, and the feet being out of contact with the starting blocks, the doing it. After having covered the use of praise in my graduate classes, I then asked my teacher trainees to go out into the field and observe a teacher and record the form of praise being used out of about oh, 10 or 11 different types that we cover. Only two or three have been shown to be effective in doing what we wanted to do, prompting more of the student's behavior. But they look for the form of praise used by the teacher and how often each type is used. Which dimensions are we focusing upon? Yep, here we're noticing the topography, the shape, the form of the praise, and how often, the frequency of each. Was that praise utterance descriptive, general, effuse, labeling, controlling? And how much was each one used? So how will we know if a particular behavior truly is problematic or not? How do we know what the starting point is when we decide to intervene and how will we recognize whether or not our intervention is effective? Well, we're going to gather data, numerical or temporal in nature. And the name for the various data recording procedures that we're going to use to collect the data is called behavioral recording. Yes, in this segment, we've covered definitions and dimensions. In the following segments of this video series, we'll be looking at the various procedures for collecting data on the various dimensions of behavior.